The story of Florida is a story of water. From its vast coastline, lakes, wetlands, rivers, and springs, to its history of development and its undeniable draw as a tourist destination, water is Florida's lifeblood. It sustains Florida's diverse environment, flourishing economy, growing population, and enviable way of life. In fact, water is so vital, cities and counties in the Tampa Bay region fought over it for decades. Bitter legal battles dominated the headlines. The environment suffered. Economic growth and development stagnated. Parochialism ruled the day, in part due to competition for affordable drinking water. But all that changed starting in 1996 and culminating two years later on June 10, 1998, with the signing of a regional water accord. 25 years later, Tampa Bay Water endures as a model of successful regional cooperation, collaboration, and conciliation. Yeah, Tampa Bay Water is um, probably the, the greatest success story of our region, where we actually work together as a region to solve our problems, and it's, you know, it, it cut groundwater pumping, which has allowed lakes and wetlands to come back. It's probably the biggest environmental success story we've had here in the last 30 years. It's provided ample, clean drinking water for our region. This thing has been incredibly successful. Incredibly successful. And when you think about what we were trying to achieve, everybody giving and getting, and, you know, we, we, we would have lists of what you gave up and what you got and how they balanced uh, over time. It, it, I think the pressures of today uh, need to be seen in the historical context of what the people who participated in that process saw. Well, because of all the uh, the the animosity and the, the bad stuff that had gone on, you would never have had the United Nations without World War II. And so... So that's what happened is they had World War II, and so now this, this uh, generation of uh, uh, leaders wanted to make sure that they would never have to do that again. How we changed our, our position over time from sort of a parochial, go-it-alone approach to a regional collaborative approach is a long story. There are lots of pieces to it. Pieces like multiple contracts, numerous water use permits, varying water rates for different well fields, six different governmental entities, a permitting agency, enabling legislation, and at the heart of it all, a regional water cooperative, the West Coast Regional Water Supply Authority. West Coast was created to serve Hillsborough County, Pasco County, Pinellas County, St. Petersburg, and Tampa. Newport Ritchie was a non-voting member. The West Coast was our sole and exclusive supplier of water. Um, but it operated under a subscription basis, more like a cooperative than, as it is today, more of a true utility. So if Hillsborough or any other member of government needed water, they were responsible for the cost to develop that water. Well, it wasn't a full functioning utility. It was described as a cooperative at that point in time, and it had no real control over most of the water supply. It, it indeed... At that point in time, it had developed Cypress Creek uh, and a part of the Albar well field, but it did not control the water supplies. And the West Coast would develop new sources only if there was unanimous approval, a commitment to pay for those new water resources. Between 1985 and 1995, West Coast did not provide one gallon of new water and we had added a couple hundred thousand people to the region, and more were coming. And all we got was litigation, all we got was uh, vetoes of projects. You know, West Coast was like the United Nations Security Council where one member government could veto things and it stopped. And one of the weaknesses that was identified was the structure of the organization. It was difficult at, to get the next facilities built under the subscription model because uh, the member government who was experiencing growth would be paying the full cost of that new facility. 
and the new facilities always cost more than the existing facilities. In some cases, three and four and five times more than the existing facilities. So there was a desire to, uh, hey, can I share in those existing facilities in some fashion rather than be the only person who's paying for the new facility to meet my growth? I mean, groundwater was all this agency really knew. So how, uh, how could we possibly move away from the tried and true, what we knew, to something uh, surface water or seawater desal or some other alternative, those are all more costly. Those, how do we share in the cost? How do I partner with the member governments to get that developed? Uh, there are so many questions and actually not enough of a strength of an agency that we, when we made a decision, we could actually implement the decision. We almost had to start from scratch. The problem was compounded by a burgeoning population and ever-increasing demand. Before a solution was found, the problem got much worse. The Tampa Bay Water War that took a new turn today. Good evening, everyone. I'm Gail Sears. I'm Bob Hyde. Thank you for joining us tonight. It is one of our most precious resources, water. But right now, it's the ammunition in a war between government agencies, and consumers are caught in the crossfire. From dry lakes to droughts to overpumping, you've heard the same talk for years, but a hearing began today in Clearwater to sort through the mess and make decisions on regulating our water. Well, when I took the job, there had been decades of what is known colloquially as the water wars uh, in the Hillsborough, Pasco, Pinellas region. Um, and uh, they were kind of at their zenith. There were numerous pending lawsuits. Uh, there were lawsuits in progress, uh, and there was a great deal of public turmoil, uh, the, a function of trying to do something uh, to alleviate environmental stress, but at the same time meet demand for water. Well, the context is really important. There, there we're in a drought, you know, or coming off a, a really significant drought, we'd had enormous population growth, mostly in Pasco and Hillsborough counties. And, and so you had greater water usage. You had impacts that were really evident, but they, uh, you know, not just soil subsidence and cypress domes and lakes, as I remember you, I remember you fishing. See that head, it's desired a barrier. <laughs> it was brilliant, but, but so troublesome. Um, um, so you, I mean, you had, you know, you had every day and you had almost every day, either newspaper was covering our debates and we were saying things about each other that weren't terribly kind in the press. And you had kind of this regional thing starting in economic development, emergency management and transportation. You and I sat on the transportation boards together. We were fighting over where the lightning were going to be. <laughs> yeah. And in the midst of all this, we're suing each other. I think there was this uh, just terrible disconnect going on. We're trying to act like a region in certain ways, but the most basic thing, water supply, was at odds in large part, be, as you just said, but in large part, too, because of this evident environmental damage that was occurring in your county, but not in mine. From at least the mid-1970s, Pasco County was a net water donor of groundwater to municipalities located outside of Pasco County, namely St. Petersburg and Pinellas County. By the mid-1990s, huge amounts of groundwater were being withdrawn in Pasco County well fields and transported for public supply purposes to the city of St. Pete and Pinellas County. The water wars were really about reducing groundwater pumping. Um, it had become evident that some well fields had been over permitted they were producing more water than the environment could sustain. And so that combined with drought, combined with population growth in our region and increasing water demands, led to environmental damage around some of the well fields. And the Water Management District wanted to cut those permits back. The fact is that at some point, the district decided that uh, it was the, the, first, the initial permits that were issued were wrong. So they wanted to cut back, and this, this, is, this primarily impacted the city of St. Petersburg. And that raised some huge legal issues because here you had a water supply system that was providing services 
to a community, to people who needed water, to businesses that needed water. And here was a regulatory agency saying, we can't let you have that much water anymore. No, the concern was is that the, the district was going about this using their police powers. And so uh, when you're dealing with utilities, it, it's not as simple as saying, hey, we're going to turn off your water and we're going to cut you your water supply because the, the, this water supply supplies two or three million people. And so that kind of precipitated the battle and because the utilities' backs were up against the wall and they had to protect the water supply for their customers. And here's the other cogent point. We're looking at spending $10 million on litigation and not producing one gallon of new water supply. And from Hillsborough's perspective and Pasco, which we're growing, it's like we're tethered to a thing that doesn't work. And we're fighting and litigating and spending dollars and not solving anything. And the need for a policy solution was pretty clear to everyone. That, that, was, that was critical. And, and to be very frank, the tremendous litigation cost for everybody just was old. It was, it was hey, we're, you know, all this litigation doesn't produce a drop of water. And uh, that, was, that was a concern that not only for Pine Hills County, but all the member governments were spending a horrendous amount of money on on litigation, and we were we were all spending tax dollars yeah. to to sue each other. You know, we, when you're sitting there, it's a bizarre circumstance where, at, on one side, you're voting to fund litigation a West Coast against your government that you represent, and then you go to that meeting and you're voting to fund litigation that you voted to fund on the other <laughs> side. And when you're sitting in that position as elected official, you just understand this is bloody stupid. The, the water wars were definitely a catalyst for the regional solution. It brought attention of the public to the issue. It brought the water management district attention to the table. And probably most importantly, it brought the attention of the Florida legislature to the table because with all of the local concern about pumpage, about impacts, it just became a matter of great public discussion. Along with mounting legal costs came mounting pressure from the community, which wanted solutions. The business community was very anxious for a solution to be developed because they felt that the quote unquote water wars were interfering with economic development in the region. Well, I think the economy was affected in some ways by the water wars. But locally, we knew in the business community, the development community, knew that there was a problem and we needed to pay some attention to it. I mean, in terms of impacts on our economy, uh, on citizens who were already here, what would we do if we didn't find a way to bring the resources together, both from a political standpoint and an economic standpoint? So the Tampa Bay Partnership was created. The Tampa Bay Partnership became the voice of the business community in that period of time. And that partnership then fostered the support systems that uh, West Coast needed to create Tampa Bay Water. But it was a considerable amount of personal contact and written letters uh, encouraging Tampa Bay Water from the business community. It was the first time the business community really exercised regional unity at a high level and it was, it was that particular um, issue that really brought the region together. The conflict had to end. It was, it was out of control, it was very expensive, and the longer it went, the hotter it got. Well, we did as a Tampa Bay partnership at that moment was start saying, let's get our voice amplified. So can we amplify? Imagine amplifying five and a half counties worth of businesses telling people from GTE and, and Florida Power and in Tico and others, but yeah, there were there were uh, communities that we had to um, show up at city council meetings and express again the notion of economic development about literally being able to continue to grow uh, if we call a moratorium, which was what we always use. If you if you say that word, here's what's going to happen: your tax 
your face. Here's what's going to happen. So you actually are going to go back, slide backwards the moment we declare this. So we're asking you, don't declare that. Declare that you, you understand the opportunity to continue to learn this and discuss it. When you couldn't uh, get it together on water, you couldn't get it together on everything else. So there were a lot of things that were stalled. Uh, transportation collaboration across the region was it's, it was going to get stalled. We weren't talking to each other. Economic development issues, I think, were going to be stalled. You, you know, you, water was this just big thing in the center that needed to get resolved. Tampa Bay Partnership entity, uh, kind of simultaneous with uh, this uh, evolution, and this was their kind of first project, right? And and they. Uh, there were individual members of that who clearly understood that absence of a solution in water was a really big problem for them. Without water, there is no economy. Nobody's going to locate their business in this area unless you can guarantee that there's going to be an ample supply of quality water. And uh, if, if the old system with West Coast and, and the member governments doing their own thing had continued, I don't think, I think we'd have huge water issues in this area. While we're doing the tour, one of the Barthel uh, brothers recognizes me, comes over, and I we say hello, we revisit, and I haven't seen him in six or seven years. And I make a comment about House Big Fish Lake, which was right outside the sort of lodge we were staying in. He said, I can drive my Bronco across it. Um, the water had, the, the cone of depression had just sucked the water all the way and there was no more lake. And then they had also brought online what they called the South Pasco Wellfield, which was just across the Hillsborough Pasco County line. And all those permits were up for renewal and the district kept putting them off because they kept getting all this information. The citizens were raising cane about how their wetlands were what being wiped out. The lakes were going dry. I got involved because I was really worried for my children's safety and also my investment in a water ski sized lake that all of a sudden no longer was. And I was became president of the Coalition of Lake Associations. And what we found was that individually we couldn't do or say as much or have as much influence as if we banded together. The, the press was clearly playing in this game as well. And so you had both the St. Petersburg Times and the Tampa Tribune that were vitally interested in this and in sort of enjoying reporting on how we were angry with each other and not working it out. But they were clearly, certainly the editorial boards were felt very strongly about, uh, about us solving this problem. Regional leaders wrestled with the problem, community outrage, and elusive solutions. Meanwhile, the administrative law judge overseeing the hearing regarding the St. Petersburg Wellfield permits was reaching his conclusion. While we are waiting for the recommended order, I think there was a little bit of fear and hope because we didn't know what the outcome was going to be. So during that time, uh, I was working with Ed and we were coming up, with, well, he was coming up with ideas and asking me to draft things, draft some language to go along with this concept. Um, look at the statutes. Can we do that? What are the different statutory exchanges, if any, that would need to we need to make if we're going to go with these run with these ideas? What do you think the other member governments are going to think about these? What do you think their fears would be, or what are they going to try to accomplish, or what do they want to protect? And we all worked together to support the St. Pete permit because the others knew, you know, they were next. And so during that process, it was all about, you know, supporting the, the issuance of the permit in St. Pete. But other things were happening at the same time. There was even before the group of 18, there was internal dialogues that I talked about earlier between certain members on the board. So actually what happened, I, I, and I don't know if this story's ever been told, but what happened uh, was that uh, we went to the, to the administrative hearing, will last for eight weeks. And uh, the administrative law judge uh, found that there had been um, evidence of environmental impact, but those were impacts for the three St. Petersburg well fields that had occurred back 40, 50 years ago. And that fact, the situation in recent years had been improving. And so the judge recommended to the water management district that they not cut back their permitted use, instead renew them at what they were currently using 
which is only one or two million gallons a day less than what they were permitted for the next 20 years. And so the, the district viewed that as a, as a loss and were uh, wondering what the heck they're going to do, you know, going forward, you know, how we're going to make this happen. Well, in 1994, I got elected to the Senate. And as luck would have it, I was the only legislator out of 160 who represented both Pinellas and Pasco County. And in my first session, I was sitting quietly minding my own business in my office in Tallahassee. And I look up and at the door were all five members of the Pasco County Commission. Uh, you know, and uh, several of whom had helped me get elected and whatever, you know, and and, you know, they said, Jack, you got to help us. You know, the lakes are going dry, the wells are going dry, whatever. And, you know, a couple of them were in tears. And, I mean, they were, they were very upset. And so, you know, when I got home, I agreed. And then I went out, went to Bartle Ranch and a few other places out there and saw what they were talking about and decided that we needed to do something about it. We were focused on trying to find some lasting solution. Um, in the legislature, we don't do that very often. We don't interfere with local governments. But in this case, it was a regional effort. And we, it was either going to be solved regionally or it was going to be solved by the state of Florida. There were lots of issues on the table, and the legislature very upset on the amount of money that was being spent in the litigation, because I think it was upwards of $5 million a year uh, in trying to maintain the flow, the consequences of the drought and the damage that was being caused, all of those things manifested themselves in the legislature. And yeah, if, if we had not had the either fix it locally to our satisfaction or we're taking it away from you, um, and I think the thought was it goes to the governor and cabinet. I think there was a move and a concern that we just cannot let this decades-long water war continue. It doesn't produce new water. It's a waste of resources. And it's just not the image that the folks in Tallahassee wanted of their state, that local governments can't get along. Uh, especially, I think the Tampa Bay area is a very important region uh, for the whole state. In the absence of a solution, somebody was going to step in, and that was going to be the legislature. In fact, uh, one year, we, I specifically, uh, engaged in the proposal of a bill to make it a statewide water authority. Uh, that was uh, an attention getter. And I'm sure that that, as intended, came down to some of the local governments. With the Florida legislature, the business community, the media, state regulators, and the entire Tampa Bay community expecting solutions, West Coast convened a series of workshops starting in March of 1996. 18 representatives, three from each government served by West Coast, met to discuss funding options for new alternative water supplies. The group's composition and workshop format proved to be innovative and productive. I just simply concluded that we had to somehow or another get in a room <laughs> and begin to uh, talk about uh, very difficult questions and, and, and issues uh, and that it was going to be pretty ugly um, at the onset. So the makeup of the group of 18 was really important. You had six local governments. You had three people from each government. So you had the public utilities director. That was really important so that they could tell you what was going to work and what wasn't going to work. You had an elected official. In most cases, you had an elected official. And that was extremely important because it wasn't a staff person going back to the collegial body, to the commission or the council. It was one of their colleagues that had been sitting there for day after day after day to talk about how the deal was evolving. But most importantly, you had the administrator, you had the city administrator or the county administrator at the table. You had people whose whole job is to solve problems. That's what they do. They make things work. And so when you put people of that position and that experience at the table, talking to each other as colleagues, that made it, that, that is, I think, what made the huge difference. Then they all had to be in the room at the same time. Yeah.
and you know you couldn't you know you couldn't uh, use third hand gossip and so forth that it, it, everybody was sitting right there right. And, and that was a very effective approach to problem solving that really I've always thought was a model that could be used for a lot of issues around the country. It also allowed us to have to step away from the legal arena uh, and, and talk about this in a more abstract way um, because we weren't fighting the lawsuit at the same time we were trying to solve the problem. Two months after its initial meeting, the group of 18 envisioned a possible solution to the region's water supply problems. You know, a lot of good governance starts with a shared vision, and, and nations are built in, around those things, so we had a shared vision. It came up at the second workshop, is my recollection. I believe it was Ed Taranchik. Ed suggested maybe we should look at a regional utility. The third workshop was a visioning exercise. Through that exercise could see what might be possible to better the situation that they were in, and it gave them something to aspire to. Somebody came up with the idea of, hey, if we were a regional utility and everyone paid the same price for water and this new utility had to supply that water no matter from where it came from, that would be a way that we could move forward. I think Jerry Maxwell was the first person to have the vision of how this is all going to work. In his mind, he had a plan of how all of these pieces, and there were many pieces, had to work together. The legislature had to be in there. All of these local governments. When the focus followed Jerry Maxwell's vision of we need this sort of regional approach, then we saw Senator Lapala, Representative Safley, pick it up and refine it and focus on that as opposed to some of the other alternatives that were being offered. The four words that I first heard came out of David Fisher's mouth, common ownership, common rates. Yep. We have this billion dollar deal, this extremely complex deal, and boiled down in a way that everyone could understand. I think there was a, a mindset that we've got to do something different for the future. And this is the closest we're going to get to having something that's beneficial to everybody. I, I always felt that a regional approach to almost anything was co probably going to be beneficial. With a shared vision of a regional utility with common ownership and common rates, the group of 18 spent the next two years negotiating the details. The group relied on professional staff and a team of engineering, management, financial, and legal consultants. <clears throat> the lead role was the group of 18, uh, the elected officials, the administrative heads, and the utility directors. Um, I think it was premature at that time for the lawyers to step in. The policymakers and the administrative staff and the utility directors had to come to some basic agreements. We had to set the policy first and decide what we wanted to be and that was irrespective of legal issues and the litigation. And then you bring the lawyers in. So, you know, um, they, they, they played an absolute vital role in framing the agreement, but we couldn't have them driving the solution. The KPMG report was significant because it provided a financial understanding of how the utility would work. And it also gave the member governments an idea of how their finances might work. They served up a range of options, and the board adopted one of those options in the fall of 96, I think, and codified it. It came back in December with our board saying, this is what we want to do, and we came to an agreement in principle. Yes. And that was um, really that was okay. The this is the deal. We're moving <laughs> forward with this deal. That's right. It was the actual vote. But the idea was just to kind of create a win-win situation and take the focus away from the, you know, that present moment to something in the future that, you know, if you're going to reduce the dependence on the groundwater and create a new supply of, you know, approximately 90 million gallons per day, then how do we travel that journey? And what is the equitable way of doing that? so that the counties that are, you know, there has a less opportunity to grow because they are, they are fully grown counties versus the county that has a more opportunity to grow. How do we bring equity into, into that? You've got to engage people in dialogue. You have to help identify the problem. You have to try and find the middle ground. 
The shuttle diplomacy um, here locally included meetings with the Tampa Bay Water Board, the group of 18. We also had individual meetings with all of the member governments and their leadership to try to draw out what's the stumbling block here? What does it take to create this vision in a way that it works for you? There were two critical points upon which the new utility was created. Exclusivity, meaning the new utility would be the sole and exclusive provider of drinking water. And a uniform rate, meaning that all customers would pay the same rate for drinking water. One water system with one water rate. When we framed Tampa Bay Water, this group of 18, the intention was that all drinking water supplies would be produced solely and exclusively by Tampa Bay Water. So exclusivity means Tampa Bay Water then develops all the water for everybody. The rate that Tampa Bay charges is uniform to everybody, and nobody has an escape hatch. One of the key components is that Tampa Bay Water is the exclusive supply of water. And, you know, there's a page and a half of things that the members can't do to get around that particular prohibition. It was an absolute condition to be able to tell bond markets there's not going to be end runs around us. Other member governments gave up their water supplies as a as condition of exclusivity. But the bond covenants reflect what's in the interlocal agreement. And so uh, without exclusivity um, in terms of, uh, of the authority, uh, basically uh, having the right to provide water to everybody and, and keeping uh, the members from having their own water production facilities in the future, there would have been no financing. The companion was uniform rate because in the subscription system, since member governments were not all interested in the same production facilities, their rates were different because the rates were based on the costs of the production facilities to which they subscribed. And when you went to a uniform system, which is a, cos a cosmic change uh, in structure, they are really paired. Uh, there was no interest in exclusivity unless people felt they were going to get the same rate as everybody else. If we put the debt of Tampa Bay Water for water supply development ahead of the debt of the individual municipalities and counties, now you have something that you can take to Wall Street and sell. So we had to um, put together what is the strength of your agency. So we put, a, put this together in a presentation and waltzed off to Wall Street and got our agency rated. And right after we got the agency rated, we needed to borrow funds in order for all this not to fall apart, member governments had to get paid for their supplies. And so I believe we issued somewhere around $370 million just to start off with to pay each one of the member governments back for their original investment and kind of give us a little seed money. Another important detail was whether the city of Tampa would be part of the new regional utility or go it alone. There were big thorny issues that we sometimes had to decide step and work on some other things that maybe we could reach agreement on and come back to the more thorny ones later. One of the big ones was the city of Tampa. Um, they um, had the river source. They had a lot of reclaimed water. They were more or less self-sufficient. Well, the city of Tampa has been historically blessed with the Hillsborough River, which met its needs for so many decades that it didn't, from my perspective, they didn't perceive that they needed to be part of this for their future growth. I do believe that there were business leaders within what's called Tampa Bay Partnership that approached Mayor Greco and encouraged the city of Tampa to remain a part of the region um, as a, a voice. There's a, there's a group called the No Name Group that I guess still exists, uh, which was some of the really most powerful business people in Tampa Bay. And I remember and I can't remember who was in charge of the group uh, uh, but at that time, but I remember calling them together and asking them to lean on Dick Greco because that was, that was a problem, you know, toward the end. And, you know, and they had enough influence to make things happen in Tampa. Yeah. 
uh, in early March when we were really trying to tie down the relationship between the city of Tampa and the remaining members, we re rewrote their provision three times in two days. And that was in conjunction with Tampa Bay water staff and uh, the city attorney's representative from Tampa. And uh, thankfully, I had a lot of people that knew what they were talking about, what they were doing, and I had to listen to it and pick out what we thought made the most sense and go with it. And uh, there were a few skirmishes back then with several of the counties, several of the cities, but when they came together, it's been working very, very, very well. So it was tremendously important that, uh, that we listen to the right people and thoughtfully turned out right. The entire process was intensive and time-consuming. Adversaries that had sparred in the legal arena had to put aside their differences and move from parochial conflicts to collaborating to find common ground and create a regional solution. You know, people had very strong opinions. I mean, we had to have a strong opinions about water. And as I mentioned before, that was a time where we were involved, evolving into comp plans and, and real planning that was thinking about how are we going to serve our, um, serve our community and serve our constituents, but we also had to be thinking about um, not, not just water, but, you know, growth management and all that kind of thing. So um, I, we had some real challenges, yes. There were times where it looked quite hopeless. When you say it was hard work, it was incredibly complex, and it took hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours to sit in that room and work through the details of how this is, you know, how do you get from a subscription process with a veto to a unitary rate and a you know, uh, a common supply. I think there was a level of frustration from time to time that when um, you weren't making as much progress as we had hoped for that, that uh, you know, it's a little discouraging. As everything was moving, you would suddenly get one, uh, one of the members take exception to everything. And it was like two steps forward and one step back of resolving whatever that exception was. I remember feeling during the whole process that it, it really took a lot of patience for everyone to keep hammering at it and working and going through the long meetings and coming back day after day and then repeating discussions that, that had already uh, been talked about at length. And I wondered if people would have the patience to stick to it. But I think it's a testament to the whole group that they were able to stay focused and remain patient and be able to hammer out a deal. It, it created an environment where you could bring the public constituency issue to the table by individual elected members. And they could express the fears and consternation and, and uh, troubling aspects of the conversations that were going on. Uh, and over time, instead of those being confrontational, they became informational. Um, and you could see elected officials looking at one another and going, yeah, I could see that would be a problem if I was in your shoes. Uh, you know, and how can we think about that and incorporate in our problem solving and solution search ways to lessen uh, the impact? And... Uh, you know, those were joyous moments uh, when they occurred. Uh, if, if the group of 18 couldn't come to some consensus on the issues and the programs and what the future was going to live, no amount of lawyers could, <laughs> could do that because they would have just hit, a, you know, a roadblock. Uh, so, and so I think the uh, group of 18 was was just instrumental in uh, building consensus, which ultimately became the backbone of the of West Coast and the system. There was a, a, a Tampa Bay Water loyalty that was starting to develop, and we were starting to care about each other's positions, right? And I remember fairly early, I remember this because 
uh, right before one of the meetings, Fred Marquis came to me and, uh, of, of the group of 18 and he said, I got to go to a doctor's appointment today. I'm just, I forgot I got to go. It's like one o'clock and I got to go. And at one o'clock he stood up and kind of in Fred's typical way, kind of stormed out of the, and I, and everybody, there was this stop and I don't remember who said it, but they said, is Fred okay? Did we piss him off? What did we do? And I said, I said, no, no, no. He, he, he had to go to a doctor's appointment. He, he's fine. And I was like, oh, okay. And I went, whoa. At the beginning, no one would have cared if somebody had stormed out. That would have been probably fine or normal or expected. But as we got to, right, we started to think, I'm going to get a little more worried about this. You know, and then, as you mentioned, then there was some joy. There was some humor. There were times when we were laughing at each other. Over time, West Coast and its members realized that the best path forward for the region was to work together cooperatively. The Southwest Florida Water Management District realized that it, too, needed to find a more cooperative path forward. I knew that uh, uh, the regulatory approach was not going to work. We had just come out of the water wars, and both sides claimed victory. But neither side really achieved victory because there was a lot unresolved. I think there was, ex there was exhaustion on both sides of the table. And people began to see that arguing and fighting will not create a solution. We need to start talking and working together. Well, who, who led that change in, in philosophy, so to speak, and the board level? It was Roy Harrell, Joe Davis. Uh, and I'm sure there were others, but they were the most, they were the strongest voices and the most uh, effective in, in the discussions between the board members at the board meetings as to what would happen. Uh, and, he, and Roy Harrell and I, I, I managed the staff, he managed the board. And that, and that, that was the way it worked, and it worked well. Part of the problem was created by Swift Mud. I mean, they gave these folks permits to pump all this water in the first place. And so, you know, it's, it's you know, and, and I'm, I'm an advocate. I, I grew up through the water management district system. And, and if you make a mistake, you got to fess up and you got to pay the piper. So Sonny, you know, came up with the idea, we, if we can provide some money so that we won't see some extreme increase in the cost of water, then we ought to be able to make this work. And so that's what really was the impetus, what Roy did and what Sonny did and getting with Ed and Steve and started massaging this thing to figure out how can we make this work. You, know, you can't shut down society and its ability to uh, function economically because of your regulatory dreams. You can't do that. So you have to accommodate that. The partnership agreement was very important to getting governance done because it linked the, the third leg of the uh, stool, as you say, um, the regulator. The partnership agreement was critical to get governance done. The district came in with funding and they came in with a permit that gave us a solution to both build new water supplies, pay for some of them, and also to bring about the environmental recovery needed with reducing our permit quantity. Without that piece, governance would have struggled. So in the end, uh, the Water Management District ended up putting in $300 million. It was either in direct dollars or it was in land acquisition. Governance would not have happened without partnership agreement. And the partnership agreement wouldn't have happened without the governance change at Tampa Water. And so the two were very inextricably connected. And so it was very important to have them at the, uh, at the table. As the partnership agreement was being negotiated, West Coast and the local governments focused on revising the new contracts to address a host of details critical to the deal and to the members. Details like the quality of water to be delivered by the new utility, how much the new utility would pay for facilities it would acquire, how the utility would determine the new uniform rate a stabilization fund, specifications for wellhead transfers, operating standards, and more. Neighbors Giblin and Nickerson produced a total of 14 drafts of the amended and restated interlocal agreement, including multiple rewrites to address the City of Tampa's requirements for inclusion in Tampa Bay water. 
It wasn't until early March 1998 that the city's issues were resolved. Later in March 1998, the West Coast Regional Water Supply Authority Board of Directors approved the amended and restated interlocal agreement and related contracts. Then each local government voted on the contract documents, the Florida legislature voted on enabling legislation, and the Southwest Florida Water Management District voted on the partnership agreement. If any single local entity voted against the proposal, the entire process would be scuttled. It proved to be one of Florida's most important environmental votes of the past 25 years. The votes were very uh, uh, kind of nerve-wracking. I mean, it got down to where all the members had to uh, uh, approve the governance agreement and there was this sort of clock ticking from the legislature. With four of six member governments approving the governance deal and the Water Management District approving the partnership agreement, the Florida legislature surprised everyone with a near unanimous, earlier than expected vote on April 29, 1998. The next day, the Pasco County Commission and Tampa City Council both approved the governance deal. All that was missing was a signature from Governor Lawton Childs. On June 10, 1998, Governor Childs signed into law legislation enabling the creation of Tampa Bay Water, and representatives from the six local governments signed the contracts to bring their vision of a regional utility to life. This is not the usual kind of ceremony because there's so many people involved. And I think we added it up and somewhere along the line, a total of 199 elected officials had to say yay or nay to this process. And if you thought three years ago where we were, and you would have bet how many of those 199 officials would say yay or nay to what we proposed and did, I think you would think it would be pretty controversial. But of those 199 officials, only two said no, which is an absolutely remarkable number. Water is a vital resource uh, for Florida. Uh, whether you're growing citrus or watering your cattle, canoeing uh, on a river, uh, using it for industrial purposes, or what a lot of us like to do is water our lawn and we like to drink a little bit of it once in a while and want to make sure that we have uh, plenty of uh, clean water. It's a critical part of our economy and a critical part of our life. I'm delighted that the battles over water are behind us. I'm delighted the situation uh, really came from the local level with the help uh, with Tallahassee as a partner. Together, the governments of this region will lay the foundations of responsible water management uh, for the regions of 2.3 million people. The creation of Tampa Bay water was a tremendous undertaking but the work was just beginning. The new utility had to design and build 85 million gallons per day of innovative new drinking water supplies through large projects like a seawater desalination plant, two river intakes, a 66 million gallon per day surface water treatment plant, a 15.5 billion gallon reservoir, and miles of large diameter pipe to connect it all. The first new non-groundwater facilities began supplying drinking water in 2002. The rest of the new supplies followed. Since 1998, Tampa Bay Water has invested more than $2 billion in innovative new water supply infrastructure, water quality improvements, environmental monitoring, and more. That investment has paid dividends for the Tampa Bay region's economy, environment, and residents. Today, Tampa Bay Water has one of the most diverse water supply systems in the country. And in 2021, the Southwest Florida Water Management District announced the environment around the long producing well fields had recovered, thanks to reduced reliance on groundwater. And all of us working together for one, one cause, I think is very, very important that, that we continue that. Tampa Bay Water through desal, through their surface water withdrawals, so through the combination, which is the unique thing, of all these different types of supplies has secured a drought-proof water supply, and so the economy doesn't have to worry about water. And it is not a subject of discussion by board members as to whether or not there will be water to adequately supply that new development. 
it's taken for granted that it will be. This area has been allowed to develop without a concern as to whether or not we would have adequate potable water. In today's world, Tampa Bay Water continues to be the model many people from around the world come to see and hear about and talk about. And when you compare websites of the management districts and so forth, Tampa Bay Water's information is driving conservation in ways that I could not have imagined back in that period where what, all we wanted to do was stop the litigation and, and bring us all together. And um, it turned out pretty good in retrospect. A lot of the big projects that have been completed by Tampa Bay Water are some of the, the projects that really would be in the forefront uh, of engineering success in the United States. And so none of that could have happened by any of the governmental entities by themselves. We were too young and dumb to know we couldn't do it. And so we just kept forging on and we did it. The recovery is, a, is an incredible example of governments coming together, understanding what is happening and doing the right thing and having the wherewithal to do it. Yeah, Tampa Bay Water is um, probably the, the greatest success story of our region. You drive around Florida and see lakes that are gone and springs that are non-existent, and you see failed water policy. You drive around the areas of Hillsborough and, and Pasco County today, and you see full lakes and thriving wetlands, and we've added a million and a half people since then. It is so um, wonderfully fulfilling and meaningful that we've been able to strike this balance that it has evaded most people. I think the average person doesn't even know what we're talking about or didn't even know that occurred. But again, that's because this organization and all the people that have been involved in it know what they're talking about. If we hadn't have done this, many lakes would have dried up, all kinds of stuff, the river had been then, all those things, which is not something you think about every day. You do think about whether the shower works or the water comes out of the thicket. Our region's prosperity would not be possible without the selfless efforts and commitment of everyday public servants who rolled up their sleeves and worked together to solve a decades-long vexing regional problem. They understood that the cities and counties of the Tampa Bay region survive and thrive together, and water is the lifeblood of our shared prosperity. The creation of Tampa Bay Water shows what can be done when local leaders team with community and business stakeholders to build a future where our region can add residents, grow the economy, and preserve our wonderful way of life. As Tampa Bay Water celebrates its first 25 years, it is doing exactly what its founders intended, planning for the next 25 years, brainstorming new projects, embracing new technology, and expanding conservation efforts to ensure the region always has an adequate, sustainable, and affordable drinking water supply. Then I always think it's because of the people involved that you're able to get the solutions. And uh, I'd say we are the providence or good luck, whatever you want to call it. We had a unique group of people that really were hardworking and were willing to put the time in to find a resolution. And that includes everybody involved in the group of 18 and people like Mayor Greco uh, and all the attorneys. It's, it's actually amazing that the transaction ever happened at all. Yeah. And without the uh, leadership, particularly of the elected official members of the group of 18, who took a more regional approach than they watched after their parochial interests, but they really had a vision of a centralized authority. We, we didn't realize at the time we got retained how good the leadership was. Um, it's only when we look back, it's only... After the fact, when we see other communities around the state trying to address their regional water needs, it's become apparent that uh, um, perhaps it's lightning in a bottle, but we had um, tremendous leadership. The success of Tampa Bay water, to me, is a, is a story unto itself. And it's not because Jack Latvell and I sponsored a bill or the Florida legislature voted to implement it. It's because of the community that it represents and the willingness of the business community, the residential community, all coming together and engaged in a process that 
solved a problem. And, and that's what I think it's done. This uh, came at a cost for everybody that we probably don't understand, but it was worth it because we know that we can cooperate. We know we should cooperate. We see the fruits of cooperation. It's easy. It's understandable. And it's possible again. And we probably need to look at what else could we be doing better in our region and take this model and the seriousness of those conversations and the sincerity of the data and information everybody provided and do good things again. This was a great thing. This was, I was in the room with so many awesome people that I consider heroes in our region for just their compassion for me and others so I can have a glass of water. What a beautiful thing. What does it mean? It means that as a group, a very large group of people, we crafted this complex agreement based on a simple notion of common ownership, common rates that worked. It was a regional solution that worked and worked over decades. That is so cool.